Okay, so um, this week we are looking at guns and violence. Um, and this is a really good um, example of a kind of issue. It's not just the issue of guns and violence itself. It's, it's, a, it's a type of issue um, around violence, which is interesting for a number of reasons. Um, the first um, being that it's a highly polarized debate. Um, not so much in Australia, but in the United States, the questions around um, the right to bear arms, the right to, to carry a, a personal firearm, the right to own automatic assault weapons is a hugely controversial political issue. Um, and it also um, is an issue that uh, contributes to high levels of violence in that country. But b before we even get there, let, let's think about this. Um, really the question we want the answer to as people are interested in in reducing violence it's a simple question it's a question do guns make us safer okay and there's a number of versions of that question does allowing private citizens to own firearms does that allow them to protect themselves against criminals and dangerous people um, and thus make them and everyone in the society safer or doesn't it um, does allowing the police to carry firearms um, make society safer? Does the police uh, um, having having the ability to to kill people does that make does that make society safer? Um, but the big version of the uh, that we're going to look at this week, we're not going to look at the kind of police firearms thing, but it's an interesting debate to look at. We're going to look at the the sort of private ownership and. Um, um, and so this question, uh, do guns make us safer? Now, on the one hand, that should be a simple research question. Uh, we, we, can, we can study um, various situations and say, yes, guns did make people safer, they, they didn't. But how would we do that? How would you imagine a research project in which you worked out whether allowing people to carry guns made the society safer, made everyone safer, or just made the individuals carrying the guns safer? How would, how would you do that? And there are a number of different ways of doing it. Um, one, you can compare societies where there's high levels of unregulated gun ownership where, versus societies where, there's, where, there, where gun ownership is very, very uh, strictly controlled. Very few people have guns. And you can see, well, is there, are there more homicides? Are there more shooting injuries? Um, is there more violent crime? Um, the other thing you can do is you can look at countries that have changed their, their legislation, that once didn't have regulations and then move towards having regulations. Um, there are less societies that go the other way. There, it's, it's, there's, there are very few examples of societies that have good gun regulation and then get rid of it and become deregulated. It's, it's rather the other way. Um, and, and both of these things have been done. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give this away to you before we even give, have the lecture, is, is the results are known that, that stricter gun regulation reduces violence. This is, a, this is an extremely robust research finding in the field um, that ev everyone knows. Um, so that's not the question. Um, the question is, why do people still, in certain places, certain groups of people, still very, very vehemently defend the right to own firearms if they know that it makes a society more dangerous? That's the interesting question here. Um, and one of the things we need to distinguish is the difference between people being safer and people feeling safer. People, something, the, the, a government may do something that makes everyone safer, but people may not feel safer when the government does that. They may, they, 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 it, it, it may give them a different kind of feeling. So one of the questions is, does, um, does owning a firearm give people a sense of feeling safer, even if it actually really puts them at risk? Um, now, the problem is, if people feel something even though it's not true how do we work with that how do we work in a situation where as experts in the field of violence we know what makes people safe and what puts them at risk but but they don't they don't feel that and as a result they don't believe the scientific findings they but they they hold belief they they passionately hold beliefs they form communities to support those beliefs 
um, that are opposed to the science. Um, and this is really interesting. It's, it, it comes up in the COVID-19 pandemic. It comes up with the sort of anti-masking movement. It comes up with a resurgence of an anti-vaccination movement. Um, that there's a whole lot of, of, of nonsense that people believe that, that, that scientists simply know is false, but, it, but it's strongly, passionately held and supported by um, kind of uh, extreme communities. Um, and and this, this is kind of how the gun debate works. Um, um, so on the one hand, it's a simple scientific issue. Uh, deregulated guns, more guns, more dangerous society. Um, not only um, for people who don't have guns in those societies, actually gun owners themselves are more likely to be homicide victims than people who don't own guns. Certainly, people who live in a home where there's a gun are at much greater risk than people who don't. Um, and we'll, we'll need to understand why. Um, okay, so to understand Australia, we need to do a bit of history. Okay, as it stands, Australia is seen as a, a, a pretty good international example of, of, of effective, sensible gun regulation. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not one of the, the more extreme uh, places in terms of regulation, but it's not, uh, not, it's not a totally deregulated society. Um, and all of this stuff happened around sort of 1996, 1997. Um, this, there, was a, there was a massive change in the idea of gun ownership. Um, and it had to do with uh, a number of things. In Melbourne, and actually this is really interesting, the gun, the gun control uh, kind of issue actually takes takes off in Melbourne in 1987, where there were two mass murders, the Hoddle Street Massacre and the Queen Street Massacre. In the one, a uh, gunman killed seven people, killed another 19 people in Hoddle Street. Uh, in Queen Street, same year, another gunman killed eight people, injured five. Okay, this really kind of shocked the society, and it led to the National Commission on Violence, the NCV, and that, um, that reading on Australian violence is all about that National Commission of Violence that, that, that was really a di direct political outcome of these two Melbourne massacres in the late 1980s. Um, and, this, and, and it was kind of amazing. The, the NCV was really brought together kind of the best minds, the best information, brilliant proposals for violence prevention um, that are still kind of like you know, examples of, of, of good ways of doing things. Um, the interesting thing was that the, 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 the authorities asked for this commission. They funded the commission in some small way. Uh, very good proposals um, were developed. Uh, they were recognized internationally as being outstanding examples. Um, and one of the proposals was around gun control that um, that there needs to be more regulation of private firearms if, if we are to be a safer society. And the interesting thing then, this, and I want you to think about this, is, is nothing happened. Uh, you know, the commission, the commission happened, they put the best minds together, they brought together the best local and international research, they said what needed to be done, and it wasn't done. The politicians dropped the ball. Um, or maybe they didn't drop the ball. Maybe they deliberately put the ball down because they didn't want to handle it. Um, they, 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 they wasn't, there wasn't a political taste for, um, for actually implementing the violence prevention strategies from the NCV until 1996, okay? Uh, and what happened in 1996? Um, in Tasmania, in Port Arthur, was the biggest um, mass murder in um, recent Australian history. Um, it's interesting, though, when one talks about mass murders, when one talks about these gun killings, there's a tendency to only look at them in terms of recent historical events of a certain kind. And there's a tendency to erase the fact that part of Australia's colonial history is a history of gun massacres of indigenous people. There's a, there's a long history of that. And often when people think about gun massacres, they, they, they kind of ignore that, that colonial history was actually built on uh, gun, gun, colonial gun massacres of, of indigenous people. Um, anyway, 
Port Arthur, the gunman killed 35 people. This is, this is a really dramatic event in, in, in recent Australian history, injured another 23. And this really sent shockwaves through the country. Like we, we cannot have this kind of mass murder happening. And it led to the implementation of new, new, new gun laws. Some of them followed the National Commission's recommendations. They didn't follow it particularly accurately. Um, but one of the things they did is they also bought back weapons. They also said, look, if you hand over your gun, your, your private firearms are now illegal. You've got, to give it, you've got to hand it to the cops. You don't just have to hand it to the cops. You'll be compensated for it. And that was an important part, that they raised a massive amount of money to compensate people for the loss of their firearms. They in, introduced very significant restrictions on people just walking into a shop and buying a gun. Um, and one of the interesting restrictions is the reasons you can own a gun. Okay, and self-defense is not a reason, and not a legal reason to have a firearm license in um, Australia. Um, and yet it's probably one of the biggest reasons why people would want one. So you can have one because you are a hunter and you're part of a gun club, but you can't, you can't say, I, I need a weapon for self-defense. Um, there's no legal provision for that. Um, Okay, so that's the point. That 1996, the big, um, the, the post Port Arthur moment, um, these very effective laws um, kicking in, um, and the, the National Commission on Violence was very clear on a number of things. Firstly, they said gun ownership is not a right. There's no, there's no innate human right. There's no constitutional citizen right to own a gun. This is not a thing. Um, um, what people have a right to is they have a right to life. They have a right to safety. They don't have a right to own a gun. Um, so the government's responsibility is to make is to to ensure people's safety and well-being and 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 that they're not um, exposed to massive risk and randomly murdered. Um, that is the right people have, not a right to own a private firearm. And the, the really important different emphasis. They pointed out that the number of guns needs to be reduced, that if you have a lot of guns circulating, you have a dangerous society. And um, this is almost universally true. The gun lobby sometimes point to a couple of outlier examples like Switzerland, where this is not true, but those are very, very specifically different examples. Okay. Uh, they also said that high-risk individuals should not have access to guns. And this is the interesting outcome of Port Arthur, that the perpetrator of that mass killing was 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 to a large extent sort of painted as a high risk individual. Um, okay, so what was the, what was the result of of this this legislation? Um, well, gun homicides dropped dramatically. Um, it did what it was meant to do. The the people became safer. The society became safer and continued becoming safer um, for years afterwards. The interesting thing, though, is that gun suicides um, account for more deaths than gun murders. Um, actually, more people kill themselves with guns than kill other people. But that one of the outcomes of the gun um, le legislation was that there's much less gun suicides. And in fact, it wasn't just that people started um, using different means uh, for suicide. It's that suicide actually declined um, in the society. Um, and so it, it reached a point where, uh, in comparison to the United States, Australia has one twentieth um, the levels of gun homicide. Like lit literally, only um, one. Like for every tw for every twenty, and this is you know corrected for population size. For every twenty gun murders in the United States, Australia has one. Um, and fortunately, what has happened is there have been recent moves to weaken the gun control laws. Um, and the particular sort of political individuals or political agendas that have supported the, the move to weaken gun laws. And there has been a, an increase in gun ownership again, that from, from a low after the legislation, people have gradually been accumulating more and more guns again. Um, so there's a, some worrying signs of the weakening of that legislation and the fact that the societies may start becoming more dangerous again. Um, uh, but generally, Australia is viewed as having 
uh, by international standards, uh, statistically certainly very low, uh, relatively low, not the lowest, but relatively low levels of gun violence and, and relatively effective um, um, legislation for gun control. Um, other places, similar places like the United Kingdom is significantly more restrictive and have even lower levels of gun violence. Places like um, Japan are dramatically more restrictive and have dramatically less. And that's a kind of a, a global tendency. There are outliers and the gun lobby really pitches up those outliers, but the global um, um, correlation is when you have better legislation, less private gun ownership, you have less gun violence. That's, that, that's pretty well known. Um, okay, so this brings us on to the other problem. The other country we're going to use in our comparison today, and this is also why you're watching Bowling for Columbine as a film, the United States of America. Okay, the United States uh, has some of the highest gun ownership in the world. In fact, it does have the highest gun ownership in the world. It also has some of the highest levels of gun violence in the world, not the highest levels, um, uh, but very, very high and an extraordinary um, levels of mass killings um, to the extent that there are mass uh, killings basically every day. And, 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 and most of these are, are relatively small, right? Most of these are, are people killing like three, four people. They're not the big, big sort of 30, 40, 50. Um, and so they, so they don't even make headlines, but, 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 but mass killings uh, using guns are the norm um, in, the, in US society, 20 times, uh, gun homicide, 20 times the level um, that we have. Um, and and, and uh, uh, just think about the fact that part of going to school in the United States is preparing for a school gun attack. Post Columbine, um, the massacre explored in Bowling for Columbine, it's a thing like it, that that's like something built into schooling. The fact that yeah, that that people may come with automatic weapons uh, into the school and start shooting it up. Uh, that and I mean that's uh, that that's something that people kind of accept as a normal risk in the society, and and it reached a kind of a, a a critical point in the Sandy Hook massacre because this wasn't just like a high school massacre like um, Columbine. Sandy Hook, it was six and seven year old children that were murdered. 20 six and seven year old children were murdered by a gunman and six teachers were killed. And, and there's something even more shocking about going into a primary school, like the youngest um, kids and, and just murdering them like that. Um, and what is interesting, although Sandy Hook was really shocked people it didn't lead to any change in the United States gun legislature. If Sandy Hook had happened in Australia, there would have been political change the next day, okay? And what, when, when the Christchurch massacre happened in New Zealand, there, was changes, there were changes to gun legislation immediately, decisive, long overdue changes. But in the United States, nothing, okay? Um, in fact, what's interesting is the opposite happened, is an entire kind of fake news machine kicked in um, and these and these kind of right wing shock jocks uh, are from American television and radio started claiming that Sandy Hook never happened, that it was a false flag, um, that the that the that the, the people being interviewed, the grieving parents, were crisis actors, and they started this this entire kind of like bullshit narrative that that Sandy Hook hadn't happened, and it had been it had been faked by people who had a sinister agenda. And this is interesting because this, uh, this is really a critical issue, the way in which a lot of kind of lies and misinformation circulate around the issue of gun ownership, but around issues of violence in general, and how powerful these are and how they become even more powerful in the age of the internet. Um, and, and so there's, there, there's a large number of people, not a majority, but, a, a, but, but, but not an insignificant lunatic range of people in the United States who, who think that Sandy Hook actually didn't happen because they believe they have no way of assessing the, the kind of difference between reality and kind of made up political fiction. 
um, and and dismiss Sandy Hook as 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 as, as being a, a false flag operation, a staged uh, media event to try and give politicians the right to take away their guns. Okay, a couple more, the big ones. Uh, Charleston Church. I mean, interesting. This is attacks on on places of worship. Nine people killed in 2015. 2016, Pulse nightclub. Gunmen went into a nightclub, killed 49 people, injured another 53. I mean, these are, are massive numbers. 2017 in Las Vegas, a shooter positioned himself in a hotel with a, um, automatic rifles and shot into a crowd at a concert. Um, you know, people just enjoying themselves at a concert. 58 killed, 8 151 people wounded, okay? We're heading now into the nearly a thousand territory. I mean, this is over 900 people killed and injured by a single gunman with um, automatic assault weapons, okay? Then again, 20, uh, 2018, the Tree of Life Synagogue. Uh, once, once again, a, a, a hate crime. Um, uh, 11 people killed, 17 injured. Once again, this theme, going into people's places of worship in a, in a kind of hate-based frenzy um, and killing them when they're most vulnerable. 2018, again, Stone, Stoneman Douglas High School, okay? Um, uh, gunman comes in, kills 17 people, injures another 17. And Stoneman Douglas was really interesting because this, is the, this was the moment, and it didn't happen at Sandy Hook, it didn't happen after Pulse, didn't happen after Vegas, but after Stoneman Douglas, the March for Our Lives movement formed, this youth-based um, anti-gun um, violence movement suddenly emerged and became a political actor and a, and a form of social organization, okay? Um, so interesting, R massive gun ownership, massive gun violence, repeated mass killings, and a total utter failure of the government to do anything about these problems. Um, this extraordinary high levels of violence for a developed country, massively off the statistical kind of norms for an economically developed country with, a, with a, a strong infrastructure. So why? Why is the United States a dangerous place to live? Why, why, do, why, the, why is it impossible for them to to actually protect their citizens using evidence-based rational policies. Um, and this, this, this is something we need to look at. Okay, so a couple of things. A third of all people in the United States own guns, but it's not that, it's most of the people who own guns own a few guns. They don't just have a single little pistol for self-defense. They own several guns and many of them own semi-automatic assault style rifles. Which, which you really, it's interesting, why would someone want to own a, a semi-automatic assault style rifle? You can't really do anything with it in normal everyday life. It's not a particularly um, good sort of weapon against, say, someone trying to mug you or someone trying to break into your house or something like that. It's, n it's not a good hunting weapon. It's literally, it's, it's a combat weapon. It's a military combat weapon. What you what, when you would use it is when you want to kill a large number of people in an active combat situation. That's what it's, is literally what it's designed for. So why would members of the public be so keen on owning guns like this? Um, the interesting thing is, although a third of the US citizens own guns and they own most of the, literally most of the guns in the world that are in private hands, even though they um, well, they own 40% of the guns in the world, um, and they only make up 4% of the world's population. Um, so massively disproportionate gun ownership, but multiple gun ownership, and, and ownership of these, what are essentially uh, military combat equipment. Um, despite that, most Americans, the overwhelming majority, two-thirds of U.S. citizens actually want better gun regulation. And better gun regulation doesn't actually mean like no one can ever own a gun. Um, it, it can often mean quite limited things, like you have to wait 10 days to get your gun license. The police should do a background check on you, whether you're a known criminal, whether you have a history of violence, those kinds of things. I mean, that, we, we often talk about quite minimal regulation. 
Um, but but you shouldn't just be able to sit at your computer and order a um, an automatic assault rifle over the internet without a system of checks and balances. Okay, so how, why, what's going on? Um, this craziness that makes the U.S. such a dangerous society. Um, well, in fact, it's really quite simple. One of the the pillars of the U.S. economy is is military weapons. The U.S. is a war economy. Um, that the uh, U.S. is always engaged in wars, usually multiple wars. Um, massive part of government spending is the military. Um, the things that countries like Australia spend on schools and hospitals um, in the U.S. Is, is, is often diverted towards kind of military and the kind of militarized policing. Um, and so the guns and military weapons are a huge industry and a very, very powerful lobby. Okay, and this is a big feature of the U.S., the way in which politicians are under the influence of economic interests, the way that the system of lobbying, which is kind of legal system of bribery, um, where politicians receive funding, they receive policy written by um, industry lobbyists, they're rewarded um, for supporting the interests of a tiny minority of the ultra wealthy. Um, um, so here the critical organization is the National Rifle Association, the NRA. Um, and they are in, extremely politically powerful. They, they collectively represent the gun lobby. And the interesting thing is they, they present themselves as being a grassroots movement, as being like, we represent the, the citizens of the United States who have the right to bear arms. And this phrase, the right to bear arms, this refers to the Second Amendment in the United States, but it, that's totally not what it meant when it was developed. It's, it's, it's been, the, the meaning has been completely changed by this political lobby group, okay? And what the, the, the NRA do is they actually, they, 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 they put pressure on politicians. They, they, um, they rank all politicians according to their support of total gun deregulation. And they launch these kind of um, support campaigns or attack campaigns, depending on whether, whether um, politicians are for absolute deregulation or whether they're for kind of sort of evidence-based um, gun management. Um, and one of the interesting things, the NRA has become more and more extreme since the 1980s. At, at one point, it actually supported, you know, like the generally gr agreed upon legislation, like you shouldn't let black convicted violent criminals own guns or people who are, who are, who are known domestic violence offenders. And, and they've kind of, no, they've just become more and more extreme and they're like, there must be no restrictions on gun ownership. Um, and they also run these massive publicity campaigns. They take huge amounts of money from the gun industry and then they run these, what's essentially propaganda campaigns. And so all these phrases that you hear, um, um, that we, we started the, the, the lecture um, with is um, these phrases like, the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is to have a good guy with a gun. Um, if guns are criminalized, then only criminals will have guns. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. And you've probably heard all of these phrases. And these are all kind of nonsense phrases that have become very, very powerful through this NRA propaganda campaign. And it's interesting to look at them because, of course, all of those phrases are, are fundamentally incorrect when you analyze them from a sort of a research point of view. Um, but, they, but as slogans, they work to kind of get people to feel emotional. Oh, it's, that sounds right. It sounds right. If there's a bad guy with a gun, if I've got a gun, I can stop him. In reality, it doesn't happen. Mass shootings are not stopped by good guys with guns. There have been almost no examples. Um, um, if guns are criminalized, then only criminals. Are, that's also not true. Most gun violence are, is committed by people who otherwise have no criminal history. Um, and people who, who would not actually commit acts of violence in that way if they didn't have guns. And of course, the guns don't kill people. People kill people. That, I mean, that's just, that's just a kind of, that, that doesn't even have a meaning. It's just, it's words pretending to mean something, but they don't actually mean anything. Because, I mean, we know that when there are more guns, they get used, more and more people are injured, more people die. And guns don't 
um, shoot people by themselves, obviously, with not automatic, automated robotic guns. Um, but when you give people the ability to end a life simply by moving one finger on one hand, the chances of that happening is much greater than when they don't have that. Um, you know, if people had to kill each other with their bare hands, um, the homicide rate is very, very, very much lower than if it's simply a matter of squeezing that trigger. That's, that, that's universally been established in the research. So anyway, these, these NRA kind of bullshit um, slogans, um, the interesting thing is that they believe, they sound kind of right because they've got the best kind of PR spin doctors um, um, and it's created this political polarization uh, uh, around gun ownership where what we do, the people who actually do the research, the people who actually do the science, what we do has no impact on what is done politically in the United States. It has some impact in Australia, all of Europe, uh, many other countries around the world has no impact in the United States. Um, and this really leads us to the way in which kind of science, one, a mistake we need to avoid is that people, if you show them scientific evidence, how you got it, what the basis of it is, if you show them the research, that will influence their thinking. Um, it doesn't. Other factors other than truth, other than no, the verifiable knowledge other than scientific research affect what people believe. Um, and we need to understand that more deeply. Um, and so that, 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 the, that um, article that kind of explores the culture of masculinities in the United States is really, really important. And they show that gun culture is not just a belief people have, it's a way of living. It's a way of being in the world. It's a way of thinking about who you are and how you relate to society. And they're located sort of sociologically in, in this, sort of, this, this um, sort of process of economic decline, uh, the, the, the loss of kind of male privilege, um, men both having kind of social authority in a gendered way, but also as kind of economic power, having been able to get good jobs with decent salaries and the way in which that is sort of unraveled. And this has led to a kind of a, a, a loss of a sense of a, of a per personal identity and, and a sense of fearfulness and the way in which Bowling for Columbine shows how the media has made people afraid. A very important analysis you need to follow in Bowling for Columbine. So there's both this kind of loss of masculine status, economic vulnerability, and a kind of a media constructed fear of crime. Even as violent crime has been radically decreasing uh, during this process, um, has created a sense of vulnerability. And then, and then what the NRA comes into that mix saying, yes, but if you have a gun, you'll be safe. This thing will make you feel powerful. Like having this murder weapon um, will make you feel powerful, not because you are a murderer, but precisely because you are a good person who wants to defend yourself against criminals, wants to protect your family. So they create this narrative where of the good gun owner, the good guy with the gun, as opposed to the bad guy with the gun. Or um, in, that, in, in that sociological analysis, it's not the wolves, not the sheep, but the sheepdogs, the protectors. So this is like the, the citizen protectors who are, who are de defending their rights and their communities. Um, and it's a, it's a self-defense narrative. And it supports a kind of a traditional kind of masculinity. Unfortunately, of course, um, it's wrong. Um, when, when, when men have guns, they actually engage in homicidal acts in a way that they don't. And they particularly engage in them against their, their, their people close to them. Most people, um, the study has been done, most people, the, 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 the incidence of people using their guns in self-defense is negligible. It's, and they, they, they generally use it six or seven times more in situations outside self-defense. And when they actually when the guns actually end up being used then is not in like when I'm protecting my family from home invaders, but in situations where the gun owner is drunk and in a rage and in a kind of a, having a kind of deranged jealous episode and actually uses it against their own family, either deliberately against their partners, sometimes, you know, family murders. And sometimes by accident, this kind of string of incidents like, you know, 
16 year old daughter sneaks back in after having gone out illegally without parents permission parents hear the window opening assume it's a burglar and shoot her you know these are the kind that these sort of accidents and crimes of passion actually where the guns end up being used um much more than than in these kind of criminal like planned sort of criminal property projects um and we know this but this doesn't impact on these beliefs um so really what's interesting here is the way in which economic interest, the way in which an industry, the massively lucrative, powerful gun industry, then created this sort of public relations propaganda arm that manipulated um, the sort of American culture and created this like idea of the right to bear arms. The right to bear arms initially meant a very specific thing. And, and if you look at the phrase, it's the right to bear arms um, as part of a well-regulated militia. They never quote that part. The right to bear arms did never refer to the right of private citizens to just carry weapons and have them at home. It meant that states could organize um, military units, um, uh, kind of like, you know, like state, state armies or, or, or an armed police force. That's what it meant. The right to bear arms as part of a well-regulated militia and well-regulated, like regulated by the authorities, not some crazy 4chan-based militia. Um, that, that's what it meant. So essentially, it's, it's more saying like the police can have weapons or you can have a, you can have a, sta you can have a, a formal standing army, you can have a national guard. Um, um, but it's the, the, they just totally raised that history. And the interesting thing is that, that, the, the, the reason they even have that was initially as a way of um, the slave owning states creating military units to pursue um, runaway slaves. That's actually the history of, of the Second Amendment. It's, it's about enforcing slavery, it's not about owning private um, guns. Anyway, NRA is hugely effective creating this kind of massive um, idea that, oh my God, if, if they regulate guns, they're taking away our most basic of all our rights. They're taking away our freedom. Our freedom is embodied in the right to carry a deadly weapon. Um, and this isn't believed by the majority of, of, of American citizens, um, but it is believed by enough to make it a kind of total kind of political logjam. And the interesting thing is these ideas are fil filtering back into Australia in the last few years. Um, these ideas of kind of liberties, um, of rights, and, and, that, that, and, and that you should fear the government taking your rights away. And what's so interesting to, in 2020 is the way in which the gun legislation has been sort of weird, not the gun, the, the gun sort of propaganda system has, has been kind of weirdly rewritten onto masks, onto wearing masks that get that, that requiring people to wear masks is like an infringement on their liberties, it's of their basic freedoms. It's imposing the first step towards totalitarianism. Is this is the exact narrative of the gun lobby now being used by COVID denialists. Um, um, and it's almost the words are kind of just being transferred like phrase by phrase into this weird kind of anti-masking covered denialist movement that comes out of the United States. That is also why they are, have the, the, they are the global epicenter of the ca catastrophic epidemic um, now in 2020. Um, and this construction of imaginary threats, imaginary threats of sinister government plots, of new world orders, of of authoritarian governments taking away citizens' rights, um, that these, these things have, re have kind of really flourished in the age of the internet and become, and made it really impossible to have rational evidence-based legislation and policies that make society safer. So paradoxically, people are putting themselves in danger through these kind of crazy views. The interesting thing was that w the big pushback that happened was after the Parkland massacre, the, the Stoneman Douglas School massacre. Um, and the young people then went on the internet. Uh, they created a national movement around the hashtag March for Our Lives. And they, and, the, and they created this like grassroots youth gun regulation movement saying, we don't want to be scared at school. We don't ever want to go to school and watch people in the cl our classrooms being being murdered 
um, by, by, by people with assault weapons. Um, and, um, and it became a, a, a really quite powerful movement. Um, it has since tapered off a little, it's kind of heyday is over, but it was, it was the first real challenge to the kind of libertarian total gun deregulation lobby and gives an example of that it's, it, that it's not just these powerful industries that can um, create um, kind of these sort of misinformed worldviews, these kind of paranoid, um, destructive worldviews that demand antisocial legislation in the name of, of greater security. But there can be pushback when people mobilize uh, when the actual vulnerable people use these, the available evidence, they can mobilize and attempt to push back against those issues. 